on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Factor and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We bring you the latest OU football updates. We break down the Big 12 preseason poll, and we give you our winners and losers of the week, where we talk about Pat Fitzgerald getting fired. Please download it and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, July 12th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of July, all you got to do is visit riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now, we're actually recording this on Tuesday morning. I got to get down to Dallas, or I guess Arlington. Do people call it Arlington, or is it just one blanket, like Dallas covers the entire area situation? I feel like that may be a, like, when you live there situation, you call it something else. But for me, I just call it all Dallas. It's all Dallas. Probably wrong, but. Uh, there, there's some Arlington natives that are furious with us right now, but <laughs> right. got to get down to wherever big 12 media day is because doing, uh, doing that for Sirius XM on Wednesday and Thursday. So we wanted to get this recorded. We got plenty to talk about, but Ted, first and foremost, you are, you're in the phase of life where you're dropping your kid off from camp sounds. You didn't give me the details. I told you to save it. Everything. Okay, man. You seem Seemed like you just went through something. You know how I am. I I, I run hot. Okay? Really? I no way. <laughs> so yeah, it's we went. We were, I was taking him to camp, um, which it was great. They were actually everything was really organized, but there was a thousand people there, and I don't, that's not an exaggeration. There was a thousand people there. <laughs> At including, drop off, yeah, with parents dropping kids off and workers, and it was it was something to witness. Again, very organized. The thing that wasn't organized is all of the cars in the entire area going to the same place at the same time. That is where the uh, the real issue came in. But everything else was great. He's gonna have a good time. You, I, I'm sure he's gonna have a great time. But all they need. The people that handle football games, right? Where, hey, we're opening up lanes, we're going one way, and then when everyone's exiting, we're flipping it, we're going out. That that's yes. what they needed. A little influx, outflux. Yeah, it it was a difficult um entry and departure getting in and out of the place, but all is good. We got there safely. Ton of kids. He's gonna have a have a blast and I didn't rip the steering wheel out of the uh the console of my car. So we're good. Good. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're coming fresh off of that straight into the pod. So this should be, yeah. uh, th- this could get interesting. Who knows? All right, let's start with the OU football stuff as always, and let's start with some recruiting. Last episode, we talked about the Sooners landing Devon Mitchell over Bama and Miami, and how they're going to have to continue to win those types of battles to get the roster where it needs to be, and. Well, they are, they're going to be in some, mal- some battles, man. They are in the mix for the elite of the elite prospects. Did you, did you see on threes new player rankings? I did. I did. Yeah. So on three just put out their updated player rankings for the class of 2024 and Williams Winery, who, if you're an OU fan by now, you are you are familiar with that name. He is a 6'6", 260-pound defensive line prospect out of the state of Missouri. 
He is supposedly leaning heavily towards Oklahoma, and he is the new number one overall player, according to On3.com. I'm really not sure how the percentage stuff on their website works, but on three has him as an 80% lean to Oklahoma. Ted, it would be rather significant if OU could land not only the number one defensive line and lineman in the country, but the number one player in the country. That is relatively unheard of for Oklahoma. And I think you have to go all the way back to Adrian Peterson for them to get the number one player in the country, OU. I think. That may not be right, but. Gerald Gerald had to be close, right? You know, five-star yeah. defensive lineman, but I don't think he was the number one player. Like, he was one of the top, if not the top, defensive line prospects in that class. But, yeah, man, I – yeah. I mean, I guess PJ, is it Adebare or are we going with Adebawara? Remember when we got the pronunciation update at the spring game? I'm going to hold out <laughs> and wait until the, the dust settles on that because there's, I, I think he himself has had multiple pronunciations. So I'm just, I'm going to hold out. I'm going to wait until Toby's going to be my final answer. What Toby says on game day is what I'm going to say. So. For now, it's PJ. He was top five, though. I mean, if, if you were to go back to back years, landing top five uh, defensive line, front seven talent, be incredible. And that's not even talking about David Stone. Here's the thing, though All right, 80% to OU, number one player in the country at a, a defensive line position you're going to be fighting off everyone until the paper is in hand signed, right? Like this is the, uh, he may commit. I don't know when he's committing. I think it's actually coming up pretty quick. And it didn't he pick a date, but even when a commitment's there, this is a recruitment all the way to the end. Cause there's going to be new NIL offers. Guess what? We scraped up a couple more deals that we think, you might be able to to be in on if you come here. So it's going to be tough. It's going to be more difficult now than ever to land the, the number one player. Yeah, but at least OU seriously in the mix. You're in, yeah. I, I love this new development. It's a good feeling, right? And there's going to be some heartbreak along the way. And I know there's a lot of OU fans that, you know, feel a little bit battered when it comes to losing some of these these five-star battles in the past, but you just got to stay positive, right? Got to gotta believe that Brent Venables and this staff can close the job, and it certainly would help if David Stone gets in the boat as well, right? You, you look at those new on-three rankings. He is their number 13 overall player, and every OU fan, is super familiar with this guy. Now, if it would go a long way with Winery, if David Stone would get in the boat and then you could have him recruiting him saying, Hey man, come, come be part of the same Dean line as me. That that would be awfully helpful. And stones also, you know, you could see him. I don't, uh, apparently they're close the, his teammate, uh, Jackson, their IMGs, another, I don't think he's a five-star, but he's a really good defensive lineman that Oklahoma's in on made. I think his final three or four. Um, and then don't forget the Tatum kid who's announcing, I think in a week or so. so I believe it's July 21st. 21st. So he's, he just got his fifth star. Uh, he was a high four star and with the new player evaluations out, I believe he got a five stars of running back and the number one running back in the country. And, you know, it's between Oklahoma and USC there. Most people think Oklahoma's in the best position. So I, I know right now this recruiting class has just kind of been meandering there, not rated very high, but you're still in on a bunch of the top talent out there. And 
they could they could close this thing out with a bang and that'd go a long way. I mean, that's goal number one outside of winning games on the field is updating the roster and you have to be impressed with what Vittables has done since he's been here. Last year's class I thought was excellent. And this one is, it's going to come down to the wire, but if they land some of the guys that it, it feels like they might, it could be really good as well. Could, I mean, I don't know when it's all said and done could be better. Right. And you, you look at, and I mentioned the on three rankings just because that was, that was going around Twitter amongst the fan base quite a bit, but you look at the 24 seven sports composite, which is what I believe a lot of people still look at, right? Uh, Williams Winery is number three overall. And then David Stone is number six in, in the 24 seven sports composite. So you're talking about two top six defensive line recruits in the country that clearly is a premier position where there is a great need to update the talent on this roster, especially with the SEC move looming. Like, these are the types of guys OU has to land now. Because I was going through the player rankings, and as you go through each guy, Georgia logo, Bama logo, A&M logo, a lot of Ohio State, right? But you're you're talking about being in the same conference as three of these teams who have a lot of these top, you know, 25, 50 players already committed to go play there. That's the new reality for Oklahoma. Yeah. You you got to win those battles, man. And you got to win not just a couple of them. You got to win a lot of them. And that's where it, it, it was a reminder. It was a reminder to me, like, that's the new reality for Oklahoma. I know we, we are going to be focused on this season and talking about the games, but it, it's hard not to, when we talk about recruiting, to have the future in the SEC at top of mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, I don't know what you attribute it to, but like, there's a chance we land three top six, uh, line of script defensive line of scrimmage players in the last two recruiting classes. Uh, you know, and that goes with a bunch of other really good signees defensively at, at backer at, at secondary and obviously offensive off, offensively as well, but it's been, it would be, I don't know how far you'd have to go back to when the Oklahoma's landed five or uh, three top six players on the line of scrimmage defensively in a two year span. I it, I think obviously Venables and staff are doing a really good job recruiting, but I don't think you can ignore the fact that it coincides with the move to the SEC, right? That has to factor in. And I know that we've got a tough road ahead and like we're going to have to continue to win and win more than we are now against some of these top schools, but I guarantee you that those schools are taking notice as well. You know what I'm saying? Like, it may not be this year. It may not even be next year, but Oklahoma's coming, right, with with some of the classes. that, Like, if you really dig into how they've recruited 10 years prior to right now, this is different as far as, like, the entire – roster the entire like offense defense line of scrimmage they're coming it's uh it's good to see yeah i'm i'm with you and i totally agree i'm not gonna lie man i i'm not nervous for the coaching staff or anyone when it comes to the taylor tatum commitment i'm nervous for that guy you know and i don't know him never met him never talked to him don't know the kid at all no, know nothing about him other than watching his highlights and that he's from longview like i know nothing number one number one running back in the country that's what i know but when you're choosing between ou and usc right now man i mean i just my hope is that i, I don't i can't even say this with a straight face that everyone handles his decision and with with respect and dignity, but oh man, I'm I'm nervous for that young man. I hope he picks Oklahoma, 
I think going to Oklahoma with his baseball talent, right? I think it makes a, a lot more sense than going all the way out to USC, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm nervous for him. What, no matter what he chooses, man, that is, that is going to be a polarizing choice to say the least. It's going to be weird looking back in the history book someday and being like, well, what started the second civil war in the United States? <laughs> Interesting. Yes. It was this, uh, <laughs> Number one running back in the country for the 2024 class uh, with his final two, USC and Oklahoma. What a final two, right? <laughs> Gosh, it's going to be July 21st. going to be some fireworks. All right, let's, let's talk about this Big 12 homecoming thing that the conference announced. And I, I know that a lot of OU fans don't care much about what the Big 12 is doing right now. They are laser focused on the move to the SEC that is coming up next season. But this does affect Oklahoma. The Big 12 is launching what they're calling the Big 12 Homecoming, which is going to be a three-day celebration on Big 12 campuses during football season. Now, they are picking four campuses each year to go to. And this year in 2023, they're going to the four new members' campuses. And this is going to include a women's empowerment events, women's empowerment events on Thursday, an elementary school visit where they're going to announce a big donation for like a library makeover and stuff like that on a Friday. And then Saturday is when it turns up. They're going to do, uh, do some enhancements when it comes to the tailgate experience on these campuses. There's going to be DJ performances, merch giveaways, said there's going to be some really cool pregame flyovers. Like it sounds like the big 12 is going to try to try to make this into make these games into more of an event, which is interesting before we get into how it affects the Sooners, Ted, what, what do you think about another thing that Brett Yormark is trying to kind of elevate the brand? I like it. It pisses me off because why why it's your it's your money maker it's what makes all of these schools money why does why is this now are they like hey you know what we could do listen to this let's try and make our biggest money maker more of a spectacle a bigger deal draw more attention get more people involved get some more publicity for it Get people onto campuses to try and create uh, better environments. It's like, it's the thing that makes me so mad about the previous Big 12 is they just sat there and sat there and sat there and didn't do anything. Just sit there and collect the damn check, right? And I love what your Mark's doing. He's thinking outside the box or Actually, this isn't even outside the box thinking. It's day one, square one thinking, right? Let's make this thing a spectacle. I love it. Now, I'm all for if I'm a if I'm a continuing Big 12 member and have been there, I'm all for welcoming the new schools, but you know, let's let's maybe go to some member institutions as well and and do something that doesn't have to just all be for the new guys. I think that, you know, there's some other places that you could draw some attention to because, you know, I think that there's going to be some new, there's, there's clearly going to be a new big dog in town. Like, why don't you draw some attention for, cause that's really who you're going to end up championing is someone's going to like, there's going to be a small battle, but someone's going to take the lead and you need to get, you need to start getting some of those other names on the national stage. But right. And all in all, it's a great idea. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. And I think I think the focus is making those four new members feel really welcome. Right. And to get those fan bases who are already excited, but even more excited about being a member of the Big 12. Like, hey, now you're in the Big 12. It's a big deal. We're bringing this homecoming event, this three day event to your campus because you being in this league is a big deal. Don't let us down. Like, right. <laughs> not only do we need to make it a big deal, like you need to make it a big deal as well with your fans and make sure they're out in full force. Don't yeah. make us look stupid for bringing you in. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely some of that. But as as these things 
that Brett Yormark and the leadership in the Big 12, as they continue to pile up, it just makes me wonder if he would have been, if he would have been Big 12 commissioner two years earlier, a year earlier. I, do we even see OU making the move to the SEC? I, I still think OU is doing, you know, for the long term viability of the program and you know just having financial security and all that i i think it's still it's still the right move but the big 12 trying all this innovative innovative stuff under your mark's leadership it does make you wonder like could he have kept maybe not texas but could he have kept oklahoma in the boat if he would have been in charge it i i, I it, it probably does no good wondering that but as as he continues to do all this stuff that we come on here and we say we love that it it is it's a little annoying and it makes me wonder well here's what he would have done here's what any any decent commissioner would have done find where our bread is buttered and make them happy make them happy with kickoff times have their back on kickoff times have their back on on scheduling or 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 whatever goes on out there, and and maybe whenever their athletic director pushes back a little bit on the networks for for making them kick off at eleven a.m., maybe you say, yeah, I think it would be good to have our premier team in the national spotlight instead of saying, well, Oklahoma saw the contract whenever we signed it with the TV deal. They better just get in line. It's a bunch of it was a bunch of fat cats getting their check in the mailbox and doing absolutely nothing to uh to try and push the brand, to try and keep things together, to try and keep people happy. It's the exact opposite way to run a business or an organization. We just wanted to play Nebraska at night. <laughs> that's it no i mean there's a lot more to it that went into that decision but yeah no i'm it i just wonder if brett yormark would have been in charge a couple years earlier uh, what would have that have looked like for oklahoma i know this it would have made the decision to leave a lot more difficult and that was a really really difficult decision that ou's leadership made but with all this innovative and fun and new kind of outside of the box thinking, it, it would have made the the being in the Big Twelve moving forward. It would have made it more uh, a more exciting proposition, right? But yeah. hey, man, never know. I, oh. hey, I feel like he would have been the guy that says, "I can kind of see the writing on the wall a little bit with the way things are changing, the atmosphere in college football." We better be prepared for a contingency plan should we ever find out or hear that our big dogs may go somewhere else. Like, we better have a proposal in hand and ready to combat that. And some other schools might have pushed back immediately, but, like, how pissed off was everyone? They're mad because the big dogs are leaving, the money the money train is leaving, like, if they had it to do all over again and, and you could negotiate something else and be ready for that, they probably would have done it. But everyone was like, you heard the previous commissioner, like the day before it all happened. Ah, we're good. Everything is fine here. I'm not worried about the big 12 at all. Well, we know how that went. Yep. So mentioned that this affects Oklahoma. Now, the Big 12 homecoming is not coming to Norman, right? right. It's not coming to Norman when you're about to leave the conference, right? They're going to the four new members' campuses. And, Ted, you want to take a guess who Cincinnati's playing when Big 12 homecoming is going to Cincinnati? Uh, probably the biggest school they've, they've hosted in years, Oklahoma. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Big 12 homecoming will be making the trip to Cincinnati when the Sooners come to town. And it just kind of got me thinking about that game right now. I am, I'm excited for that atmosphere. It's supposed to be a really fun stadium, but I feel like this will make it even more of a hostile environment. Like having this build up, having this 
you know, these events, the excitement around that game, you're just adding, adding fuel to that fire. And it also certainly makes me think that Brett Yormark and the big 12 are going to push like hell for that to be a night game. And that, that makes things more difficult when you got to go play on the road at night, when the crowd is nice and lubed up, especially coming off some DJ sets. Come on. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, it's, it can make it a tougher environment, but it can also get the guys geared up more, right. You know, and not go into a, like, I don't think by any stretch that they're going to be sleepy going into play on the road in Cincinnati in the first big 12 game. Right. I I don't think, but uh, if that were the case and now things get kicked up and ramped up and you got a hostile crowd that wakes you up and, you know, I continue to say I feel like Oklahoma plays their best football whenever they're challenged, and a lot of times that that ends up being on the road. I just yeah. wonder what type of DJ they're getting. I with your Mark's connections in the entertainment industry, Snoop. I I don't know, man. I I don't know, but if if the DJ is really good, are are we trying to go before we have to do the radio broadcast of the game? Like or is it going to be, I would assume the DJ sets before the game, right? Or is it going to be after, or maybe both? I don't know. Maybe both. I think, I mean, you got to think about what we're doing on radio. The goal is ultimately to bring the, the entire landscape, the whole feel, the atmosphere. Paint the picture, paint the picture. We're there to paint the picture. If, if there's not a little in the background of what we're doing pregame, then I don't, we're doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. So maybe to, to be true professionals, we need to immerse ourselves in the, in the atmosphere outside the stadium to really bring the listeners into what's going on there. And uh, what is it? Nippert stadium. That's right. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. that. We'll, we'll have to have a discussion with T row about that. I know plank will be all about it. <laughs> I know he'll be all about it, but immerse yourself can mean different things. Uh, we will have to be careful. We, we will have a full broadcast to, uh, to handle. Plank will just have like glow sticks, breaking them in his mouth. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. But it, when I saw this announced, it did, it made me more excited for that game. I yeah. think it's going to be a really fun atmosphere and I'm excited about it. It, it made me more excited for that road trip. Anytime you hear like, homecoming tailgate do you instantly think food first yeah i i i imagine i imagine they're going to do something right now it the other stuff the stuff they're doing on thursday and friday like that stuff's really cool and extremely meaningful but i'm all about what that saturday is going to look like yeah should be awesome yeah all right one more thing i want to hit on Big 12 media day on Wednesday and Thursday, or I guess media days on Wednesday and Thursday. Sooners go Thursday. It's going to be Brent Venables, Dylan Gabriel, Drake Stoops, Danny Stutzman, and Jonah Laulu. Ted, I'll just leave it kind of open-ended. What, what are you most interested in hearing from these guys? I don't know. You know, I, I think um, I'm interested to hear from, like Luulu the most, like that's that's kind of the Dylan Gabriel, Drake Stoop, Stutzman, like that's that's kind of the guys that you would expect. Um Luulu's it's a little bit different. I'm interested to hear what he has to say. Um what he thinks about you know the defense, your two, you know, for him personally, a, a position change, like some of the some of the guys that they've brought into that room through the transfer portal. Um, just kind of the mindset uh, in everyone year two summer compared to year one because you and I are on the same page like you know we we believe that you win the games in the summer right and it sounds like everything's gone well up there just a little bit more I like to hear about how all that's going and I mean honestly I you're you're going to get like a lot of the same responses like from Dylan Gabriel I'm I'm 
I want to see what he's improved on, what his focus has been. I mean, I think everyone knows what what some of the areas he needed to improve on, and and some of that is him. Some of it is just kind of how things unfolded around him. But I don't know, just kind of see where all these guys have improved and and what they feel, how they feel differently right now than they did a year ago. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's that's definitely something I would hear Dylan Gabriel talk about. It's like. How do you feel at this point right now as compared to this point a year ago? I, I'm interested in hearing just how different he feels, you know, personally as a player, his comfortability in the offense, like all of that. I also want to ask him about his wide receiver room because that room is just, it's, it's not getting a ton of respect heading into the season. And I'm interested to see how he feels about that. You mentioned Lolu. And I've thought a lot about how to phrase this. Because typically when I'm there working working this for SiriusXM, we get to talk to all the coaches and all the players. right? Whether that is live on headset or off headset, just having casual conversations. And I've thought about how I can phrase why are you here <laughs> to Jonah Laulu, right? Because I, when you look at the production or lack thereof, right? Making a position change. Like he is, you know, for the most part, he is an unproven player. And it, it's a, it's a big deal when you get brought to big 12 media day. I, I remember coach Stoops telling me like, Hey, I'm taking you to media day. And I, I, I I was just like so honored that I got to go and represent my team. I was one of a couple guys that got to go and represent my team and be the voice of the team. It's a big damn deal, man. And he's just, he's not, when you look at the production, he's just not, not typically the guy you bring to media. Day. So I, I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to phrase it. Maybe, hey, why do you think Coach Venables brought you? And, and just see how he kind of reacts. Cause I'm curious, I'm curious to hear him answer that question. I would say it's a huge honor to be here. You must be having a hell of an off season. Like what have you done recently to earn yourself the, uh, the ability, which for me, I'm I, the way you put it was much better for me. It was like, hell yes. I'm missing a summer workout. I'm, you I'm end up of- making it up. You know that. Come on. <laughs> you know how that works. You know how that works. You you don't miss you don't miss shit. You end I'm, up you end up making it up. I'm with you though. I think it's awesome. And it kind of you know, there's expectations that come with it too, right? Now it's all yeah. of a sudden it's like, hey, he must be having a, a hell of an off season. What well, what do we got coming this year? Whether it's right or wrong, Laulu being there ultimately makes me think guy's going to be a starter he's going to be one of the starting interior defensive line i mean that's that's when when you get brought to this that's what it makes me think so you know i i'm just really curious to hear him talk about that and if there's anyone that can relate to a position switch and a rapid weight gain under jerry schmidt (laughs) your boy can relate so i think uh i think i'll be able to have some fun uh, talking to Jonah about that entire process because my memory serves me correctly, which it's been a while now. Not the not the most fun process to go through, if my if I remember it correctly. Not ex- not a glamorous process to get fatter and <laughs> endure everything with Schmitty. Yeah, it's hard to uh, to get fatter. And faster at the same time. It's a difficult thing to pull off, isn't it? And that's, it is. that's what everyone's asked to do. Yeah. That's awesome. No, but I I am excited to hear from Stutzman. Guy's just, he's really entertaining. A great personality. But one of the things I'm interested in is, has Venables changed at all? Right? After the six and seven season, after the struggles, defensively a year ago like has he noticed anything that's different and i i'm interested to see where a question like that would go right is he even more intense 
are you guys spending even more time? Like how, how has that season, that struggle not only affected Stutzman, but affected Venables because going six and seven, that'll, even if you're the ultimate process guy, like you believe in your process, like Venables does, you would think there are some small things here or there that look a little different, but I, I, I don't know. I'm not in the building every day. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just kind of curious to, to hear from him, maybe how the dynamic of that room has changed. You know, he is, he's the only player in there that's played any real snaps of, of linebacker. Um, at least at Oklahoma, you do have the Connor near kid that's come in. He's played a lot of football. What's it like with him being in there? You know, what's now he's kind of the guy that's going to have inexperience lined up next to him with the battle between the, the young guys at the Mike backer spot, like just some of the dynamics within that linebacker room, I think are interesting. I part of me just wants to make things really awkward with Drake Stoops. And immediately asks him, ask him if Dylan Gabriel or, or Jackson Arnold throws a better ball. Just right off the bat, just let's make this as awkward as, as we can. Yeah, and like you say, you heard that Jalen Hurts is all pissed off about the fact that he got benched. Uh, you know, right after going to the Super Bowl. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> <laughs> Start him, sit him which they served him up a really bad group of people to have to deal with on that. I don't know what podcast that was, but that was a pretty funny deal. But yeah, I mean, Drake's always, he's always fun. He's great, great in the media settings, but do wonder if he expects his role to expand. Definitely want to ask him about the young wide receivers that are kind of standing out to him. He'll probably name them all, but yeah, it, it, it should be fun. Big 12 media day should be fun. Okay. Let's get to call your shot. And we asked you guys, who are you most interested in hearing from and why for the guys that OU sent into Big 12 Media Day? Uh, this first one comes from at Sooner Script, who says, Jonah Laulu want to hear details of how the D-line is changing and improving going into the 23 season. Uh, I think we all agree with Sooner Script there. I, I would like to hear Laulu talk about the improvement that he's seen from everyone in that defensive line group. Yeah. It's going to be fascinating. I mean, we talked about a little bit in the last podcast about the, especially the edge position, how much more depth we've got there now than we've had previously. We got depth. We got experience. We got, we got some versatility. There's a bunch of guys that are better at different things, some different body types there. And then in the interior, the defensive line, Lulu's a new body there. He was on the team last year, but he was an edge guy, big, 6'6". Six, six. Um, you got Coe back, but you've added some new bodies to the transfer portal. Yeah, I I agree, because let's be honest. You know, a secondary, I, I feel like it's going to be good. Linebacker, I feel like has a chance to be good. But this team is going to go as the line of scrimmage goes on both sides of the ball, so – absolutely let's hear what they got going on yeah this other one comes from at dennis one five four seven two nine five eight a lot of numbers after dennis is uh handled there he wants to hear from drake because he has been around the longest and should have the most insight of where the two the team truly stands that's an interesting way of putting it right drake drake's been around a long time now and has been on some really good football teams, went through you know, the struggle that was last season. Now he's, at, out of anyone on that roster, he's probably got one of the better, if not the best understanding of what, what the team's potential could be, just from the player perspective, right? Yeah. Is this his sixth year? It's got to be, right? I think so. So he's been on two playoff teams. He's been through a pandemic. He's been through a coaching change. He's been through the first losing season in, in 25 years. Yeah, the guy he's seen, he's played with <laughs> how many different quarterbacks? Uh, you know, so yeah, he he's seen a lot of different things. And yeah, I, I think his perspective on where they sit right now, if you can get like the, get out of the, like the media bubble 
just kind of canned responses, uh, which I'm I'm not saying that's a Drake Stoops thing. It's just kind of in general what you a lot of times you get. Like his perspective on that, I think is is fascinating. No doubt. All right, birthday shout outs. Welcome to the world, Braxton Aaron Mark Roberts. Nice. Happy 54th birthday to Robert Coltenbacher. And happy birthday to Marilyn Faulkner. All right, let's let's talk about the Big 12 preseason poll. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel that I will be taking full advantage of as I drive down to Dallas for Big 12 Media Day. Let's go. Just download the Loves Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals and can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stop. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with an expanded mobile-to-go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamari. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise and is the best place to get your OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. It's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And hey, you hungry out there? Well, then head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. The food is fantastic, and it is the perfect spot to watch any big game. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. All right, National College Football Roundup. Big 12 preseason poll. Now, it came out last week, but we haven't had a chance to talk about it. Texas, the preseason favorite, uh, followed by Kansas State at two. Oklahoma checks in at three. Texas Tech at four. TCU at five. Baylor at six. Oklahoma State at seven. UCF at eight. Kansas at nine. Iowa State at 10. BYU at 11. Houston at 12, Cincinnati at 13, and West Virginia bringing it up the rear at 14. Ted, let's start with the Sooners. Pick third, received four first place votes. Coming off of a six and seven season, I mean, kind of kind of tells you about the respect that this program still has, right? In, in the eyes of the media. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like Last year wasn't good. Uh, you you can understand some of the issues that they had uh, with some transition, with some turmoil. Um, things have been more solid throughout this year. They've improved their roster in some spots. I, you know the history of the program, how many times they've won the Big 12. I it's it's like it's like the all-time hedge right like you don't know where to put them but man you look at the history you better put them pretty high that's that's definitely how it feels and then this is something we've talked a lot about the schedule is extremely manageable i mean you look at the preseason poll sooners only play two teams in the top six of the poll and texas is a neutral site game there in dallas at the cotton bowl and TCU has to come to Norman on Black Friday. I I don't know how many times we could say it, but you cannot ask for a much better schedule than that. You just can't. It it lines up well for Oklahoma in 2023. And I, I think that's you no know, going going back to the history. And I, I do I do think a lot of people still believe in Brent Venables as a head coach. But that schedule, that's got to be a really, really influential reason and in why OU's checking in at number three. Yeah. Yeah, it's fa- it's fascinating. I, I think – I'm not suggesting that like, people don't know or forgot 
but I don't think they factored in because we've been now for what a decade a conference that plays every single team every year right this is the first year that's not the case and that changes things sometimes dramatically and like the team that's number one texas probably has the most difficult schedule of anyone in the conference right it's tough totally different than the third team OU that has the easiest schedule. I think whenever they ranked the schedules in the big 12, Oklahoma had the 14th toughest schedule. I, that is significant when it comes to picking who your champion's going to be. Right. My pick because of schedule is, I mean, not just because of that, but there's a big factor in there. I have Kansas state and Oklahoma playing in the big 12 championship. So I voted it. Now, I had K-State number one on my ballot, which I may or may not have forgotten to send in. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. But I – and I've done this. I did it with Oklahoma. I've done it in the past. Like I just – I give a lot of respect to who won it a year ago, mm -hmm. right? And I've got all the respect in the world for Chris Kleiman and a ton of respect for Will Howard and how he played year a year ago. I think that defense, they've really settled into that 3-3-5. And I think it's very, very significant when you're bringing your entire offensive line back. Guys that have played a lot of football. So I, I, I'm i giving K-State that respect. But, yeah, that's that's why that's what I have, too. Uh, I, expect, I expect Oklahoma and Kansas State to play for a Big 12 championship. Now, will it end up working that, out that way? I got no clue. Like, I, I have no idea, but it's just going into it. When you look at Oklahoma's schedule, you could, how they've updated the roster. That's how I see it going as of now. Now, injuries, circumstances like that, those can change and, and could change even before the season, like how we evaluate these teams. But Texas, the favorite, man, first time since 2009, which is kind of hard to believe that they are the preseason media poll favorite. I I guess it, it, it's got everything to do with the talent on the roster, right? I, I guess. The talent on the roster is no different than it was a year ago. In fact, it's probably worse than it was a year ago. They don't have B. John Robinson. And they don't have a lot of key pieces of that defense that played a lot of football for him, but – Guys get better. There's improvement. I I expect Quinn Ewers to be better. He wasn't – he was middle of the road in the conference last year's quarterback. Statistically, like, he had some nice moments, but he's middle of the road guy in the conference last year. Um, I expect him to be much better. Heisman candidate? Eh. I'm not going that far, but I expect him to be much better. Yeah, and I, I just don't think there's any denying that they have a talented roster, right? I think Sarkeesian's done a good job, especially he's done uh, along the offensive line. They're starting to stack some talent by some really highly recruited guys, right? Whatever they're doing from an NIL perspective, it's working, right? I, I mean, it absolutely is. There is, I, I believe there's a lot of people that expect – that offensive line who was starting a couple of really young guys a year ago for those guys to make some big leaps. Right. And, and we'll see if they make those as not uh, make those or not. Kelvin banks. That's certainly a guy. I agree with everyone. <laughs> I, I, I expect him to take it up a level in his sophomore season, but I, I keep going to the back, back to the fact that they've got one double digit win season in the last 13 years. And Steve Sarkeesian's never won 10 games as a head coach. I keep going back to that. So I did, I didn't have them as my favorite. I didn't have them in the top two. I, I had them at three. I, I, and it had a lot to do. I think that offense is going to be legit, legit. I'll be surprised if it's not right with all the weapons that they have at the skill positions and with Sarkeesian pulling the strings offensively. Like the guy is, the guy's good, but that defense, I just, I just couldn't get past the question marks I have for that defense. I, I I couldn't I couldn't put in them in the top two, and it 
could have a lot to do with my OU bias. I don't know, but I'm said it a lot. Just going to need to see it before, well, before I give them that respect. You can call it OU bias or you can call it big 12 bias. You know, I, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm shocked at, at how many people voted them number one. I guess I'm not shocked that they are number one. I'm shocked at by how much. You got to make someone like Texas earn it. They have a good roster. That's never changed. As long as I've been involved in, in the sport, 20 plus years Texas has always had a good roster now the composition of that roster has changed throughout the years and sometimes they're defensively stacked sometimes they're offensively stacked sometimes they're skill position stacked sometimes they're line of scrimmage stacked um, I think they're more balanced now roster wise than they've been in the recent past and I think that's a good thing for them but the roster has never really been the main issue. The main issue at Texas has always been culture. How do you get the roster to play like they're supposed to? And like one of the problems with Texas is they, they've never handled success well. Like some people say that Texas is going to go down and beat Alabama and Tuscaloosa. I'm not one of those people. But I will say that if you've watched Texas, that could possibly be the worst thing that could happen to them for the entire season. They do not handle success well. They do not handle um, preseason accolades and preseason hype well. That's the big thing. If Sarkeesian has changed the culture around that problem, Texas could go win the Big 12. If he hasn't, then I imagine it's going to be the same seven and five type of season that we've seen from it. I, you know, we're, we're I'm going to get to interview Sark at Big 12 Media Day, and that's going to be one of the first things we ask him. How how are you handling the expectations? Right, and I'm very interested to see what he has to say. I got to imagine. One of the first things he's going to say is, hey, we were an eight-win football team a year ago. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, we, we won eight games a year ago. So these guys, if they want to look at being voted preseason number one in the Big 12, means nothing. But like you they mentioned. They will look at it. That's the thing, though. They will. They will look at it. They'll look at it. And what, they get 41 of the first-place votes? Mm-hmm. So, which was a lot of those preseason magazines. Now, this is different. Some of those magazines have them as like the number one, uh, every single position group, like the number one spot all the way across the board. It's crazy. Yeah. So we will, we'll see what it looks like for the Longhorns, but the expectations are high and it's going to be interesting to see how they handle those and what it looks like. But it, when you look at the rest, of the preseason poll, does anything really jump out to you in the rankings? Well, BYU, Houston, Cincinnati being at the very bottom of the poll, um, I it's not that I disagree with it. I just think that we just don't know anything about them. You know, <laughs> we don't know anything about them. Um, Cincinnati is the team that I think most people are, are the most familiar with, but you look at Cincinnati and you're like, well, they lost their coach that got them to where they are. You know, what is, what's left on that roster? It's just, it's hard to pick where those teams are going to stack up. So I guess I can't really blame, you know, people for voting them there. I'll tell you what I think is interesting. I think tech is surprisingly high. And surprise, how are you surprised by that? I told you the Texas Tech hype train is coming. Well, I guess I'm not not surprised by the hype because I've heard all of the hype. I just 
like if I was to pick a team that doesn't like if we have the poll at the end, or like the standings at the end, I think Texas Tech is well Texas too, but Tech is one of those teams that's most likely to fall. And if I'm looking at teams that's most likely to gain, Iowa State at ten, and Oklahoma State at seven. I'm with you with Oklahoma I, State. I feel like Oklahoma State's the wild card team. Just like, and I don't even have a reason. I can't tell you why. I don't I, know why. I can tell you why. Mike Gundy's a damn good football coach. He's the best. He's the one of the best I've ever seen at morphing his team into what what best fits their roster. And what I think he's won seven or more games, seventeen years in a row. I think that's right. And similar to what we said about Oklahoma's schedule, you you want to take a guess who the only team that plays every team in the bottom seven of the preseason poll is? State. It's Oklahoma State. They they it when you look at the preseason poll, they have the easiest schedule, in my opinion. They have every team in the bottom seven on their conference schedule. And they get their rival in Stillwater. And their right? non conference is easy too. I guess what Arizona State is their That's their big one. Yeah. Yeah. They've got a logo. I'm not entirely sure what it is in their <laughs> opener. Then they've got Arizona State. And I believe this is South Alabama. They, that this right. is this is all you need to know. Two of the three logos. In their non-conference, I'm not entirely sure what they are. So <laughs> that that's where they're at with their uh, their non-con schedule. And they got a quarterback that if he stays healthy, he is he's a baller. He's a gamer. We saw him out out dueling Kyler Murray for a stretch in. Uh, wait, was that what year am I thinking? Whenever we were down at Tech and he was lighting it up in the first in the, half. Didn't was it Buzzy that deflated his lung? Is that right? Maybe. And he was playing well too. Like we were, it was one of those. It could be a long night if he continues to play that way. That couldn't have been 2018. That's so long ago. It's 2018. <laughs> That's I'm looking nuts. at it right now. Isn't Alan Bowman crazy? exits game versus Oklahoma being evaluated for partially collapsed long November 3rd, 2018. Yeah. So Kyler, he was young and he was lighting it up. He can run around. He can make throws uh, from the pocket, big, strong arm, bit of a gunslinger. Fascinated to see what they do with him. Yeah. And Nardo comes in with like, what's that defense going to look like? I Oklahoma state is an absolute wild card, man. There, there's no doubt about it, but, Iowa State's got a hard schedule. I think six teams on their conference schedule are in the top seven of the preseason poll, but defense is going to be good. You're going to have a chance in a lot of games. It's going to, and this is, this is something that Matt Campbell talks a lot about. It's going to come down to the margins for them. It always does turnovers, the hidden yardage, special teams, which for, for a guy that's considered a, a great coach, they have not been good on special teams. So it, it is it, – it's an interesting year in Ames, though. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. But anytime you're going to have possibly the best defense in the league, going to have a chance in a lot of games. A lot, I bet a lot of coin flip, coin flip games for the Cyclones, and they had that a year ago, and it did not go well for them. Yeah, well, they had the best uh, defense in the conference and the worst offense in the conference. If I still expect them to have the best defense in the conference, if their offense can find a way to be middle of the road, you got yourself a really dangerous football team. Iowa State is a team that you could see at the end of the year they beat the Big 12 champion on the road and lost to the last place Big 12 team at home. Like, you know, that's the type of 
and everyone else in between is going to be a one score game. I mean, that's, that's how it was last year. So um, that I, I fully expect that to be the same, but I, I, they're just kind of a wild card for me. I don't, anytime you think a team's going to have the best defense in the conference, like you have to, you have to say that there's a chance that they could put together a really good season, right? Yeah. And also TCU, they're fifth in the preseason poll. I really have no idea. Was last year kind of a, I don't want to say a fluke, but where the, the stars just all aligned perfectly, right? Or is Sonny Dykes that good? Does all the, you know, all the guys they lost offensively and defensively, does it really not that not matter that much? Like, have they filled those gaps with talented guys? Right? They've done a really good job on the portal. Bryles coming in as offensive coordinator. And Chandler Morris, you and I, we are we are big fans of what he can do on the field. I just part of me wonders like, are people sleeping on TCU and they're just going to be really good again? I I don't know. I don't either. But I'm pretty confident in saying this. When you have a season like they had in 2022, right? even though they lost the Big 12 championship game and they got just absolutely destroyed in the title game. You go win a CFP game, you go through those experiences. It's just got to, it's got to change the way every guy in that building carries themselves every single day, right? Like, Hey, we are, we're those dudes, right? We went and won a college football playoff game. Like we were, we were one of the last two teams standing that I just, I never did that. You did it. I, I I never did that. So I don't know how that can change the culture, uh, the confidence, like just how you carry yourself every single day as a player in that, in that program. I, and what type of big picture effect does that have? I don't, I don't know. Well, just quickly on that, I TCU, they haven't played in a national championship since they've been in the big 12, but they've, They've had some really, really good seasons. But what has happened is in between those good seasons, there's been some really bad seasons. And I think a lot of that is like just depth. You have like the stars aligned. You got a bunch of really good talent on both sides of the ball. And you're able to put together a really good season. Those guys leave. And then you kind of kind of build back up to that peak again. I don't know if that's going to be the same thing with TCU, uh, but I think that's what's happened to them in the past. The thing is, is they're better at quarterback than they've been previously. When they would lose a good quarterback, it was like, okay, it's, you know, it's a crapshoot. Is it reasonable to expect that they could be better at quarterback this year than they were a year ago? Like, I know the, the year that Max Duggan had. It was incredible. But you do have to go back and remember that he lost the battle, position battle, to Chandler Morris. So, like, I'm not suggesting that Chandler Morris is going to statistically have the same type of year as Max Duggan did last year because he's he just doesn't have the same weapons. It's not, it's not even going to be – I don't even know if you could say it's close. But, like, do they have a better quarterback than they had a year ago? They have a guy that beat the other guy out. I know that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's weird to say that, but I, I would be surprised. Right. And it's nothing against Chandler Morse. Duggan was just on a heater a season ago. Yeah. Just a special season. Right. Had your, you mentioned it had really good weapons, really good running back in Kendra Miller. A first rounder, a wide receiver in Johnston. Like they, they had With some Johnston. You had the six, six, what, uh, he's back. He's Williams. back, but you had the huge tight end. He's uh, back. Darius Davis. He's not, he's but... not. Tay Barber's gone. Yeah. You ha- but I don't know. It's it'd be interesting to see. I'll ask, I'll ask Sonny Dice at big 12 media day. Is it possible you're better at the skill positions? This season, and uh, we'll see what he says, and maybe that will change, or that'll 
affect one way or another how we feel about TCU offensively, yeah. right? But yeah, it is. It's an interesting conversation. Like it's because I think some people just expect this big drop off for TCU, and I'm over here going, uh, I'm not so sure. I think five is about where you have to kind of put them, right? Yeah. And maybe they're right there when it comes to the conversation of playing in a Big 12 championship game, and maybe they are close to 500 in conference play. Like, I just – I'm I'm not sure. But I, I do think that having the success they had a season ago, it's got to v- affect the way that everyone in that program feels. I just it, – it's got to – it's got to feel that you way. Think, you would think. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first, Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, students prepare to meet their potential with an individualized academic path that strives for success. Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSSAA athletics where they've won over 100 state championships and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. And attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica compares coverage offerings and pricing and orders on a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Insurica's goal is to help you avoid a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. As always, Ted kicks off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? Well, I had to go with LSU. Um, First time in history, teammates have gone number one and number two in the Major League Baseball draft. Paul Skeens goes to the Pirates. I hate that for him, but uh, still pretty (laughs) cool to go number one overall. And then Dylan Cruz goes number two to the Washington Nationals. Uh, pretty impressive. I mean, everyone remembers Skeen from the World Series. He ended the season with 209 strikeouts in 122 innings pitched. Good That's pretty l- awesome. <laughs> Good Lord. That's a big dude, too. Yes. very. I mean, that big is a dude. big dude on the mound. And did you, did you see the part where they hadn't announced the pick yet in ESPN? accidentally they were going through each team and like what picks and they already had him on the pirates graphic <laughs> like I before the pick that. even it was funny. pretty funny <laughs> yeah he had i mean incredible big dude throws incredibly hard and does it seemingly effortless um interested to see what he does in the league and then dylan cruz back-to-back sec player of the year that's pretty impressive uh Hit 426 and 17 homers his, his last year. Uh, pretty cool. First teammates to go one and two. And the feeling is both of those guys should uh, climb their way through the minors pretty quickly. Yeah. So I was, I was reading about those guys, you know, just a, in a historic accomplishment for that program, right? Win a title, go one, two in the draft. Just what a run. Baseball's so interesting. Like in football, the number one pick of the draft. Like you think about what the expectations are for Bryce Young next season Day for one. the Panthers. Yeah. It's like, hey, you better come and start, start turning this thing around. Like all the pressure in the world to come out and perform in baseball. These guys get picked and they just kind of disappear for a little. It's a, it's such weird. a strange system, strange sport. Very weird. Yeah, it's it's wild. I mean, think about that too, though. Um, Brian Kelly going into year two. Baseball coach won a championship in year two. Women's basketball coach won a championship in year two. And he's got the quarterback to go do it, man. They're a dangerous team this coming year. I know he's he's kind of pushing all that off to the future, but like this may be their year to strike in the SEC with, with some uh, 
a little bit of change going on. Georgia's changing quarterbacks. Alabama's changing quarterbacks. Just pretty interesting. Don't. How can how can of all people how can you suggest that LSU may win a title? Come on, man. What are you doing? Just saying. Fair. That's why you're the best. Because you're fair. You're you're just saying. (laughs) I like that. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the week? I'm going back to back. Pat Fitzgerald. Ooh. Happened quick, huh? What a development. We talked about this Sunday uh afternoon sunday night and weren't sure what was going to happen in the future the future happened fast fired yesterday and seems like we're gearing up for a legal battle i mean you could legally you could say what you want about the decision should he have been fired should he not have been fired what did he know what did he not know but the decision to the way they went about firing him was not very good legally. So fascinated to see how all that unfolds. I I think it could get a little sticky. Now, in a perfect world, it all gets handled behind closed doors, and they settle, and who knows what Pat Fitzgerald gets. But I think he had had like 40-something million dollars left on his contract. I mean, it's a big number. One of the things I don't understand, Northwestern's supposed to be the smart school. How can the leadership, how, how did they handle this as poorly as, I, as they did? And of course, the allegations and all these things that went on within the program, that it's weird, it's, it can't happen. Like Pat Fitzgerald, whether he knew or not, which I find it incredibly hard to believe he didn't know anything about that hazing stuff with how long he was there and just his presence in that program. But how can they handle it as poorly? How can the leadership handle it as poorly as they did? They're supposed to be nerds. They're supposed to be the super smart ones. It's amazing that they can't see like. I was joking about how stupid a two-week suspension during the dead part of the year is, right? That's stupid. Like, how could you not see that doing nothing is opening yourself up to a massive PR nightmare? And that's exactly what happened. Like, how can you read a report on one day Say we're given a two-week unpaid suspension during the offseason. Then be inundated with social media, and you know how that's going to happen. A newspaper article comes out, and then the next day, you fire your coach? Nothing has changed. You had a third-party independent investigation that went through everything. They talked to everybody. You, all the facts are on the table. Nothing has changed with what the leadership knew from one day to the next. This day, it's a two-week unpaid suspension in the offseason. The next day, you fire your coach. That is like, put this up on the, on the whiteboard for anyone that's teaching a class on like how not to uh, go through any type of public situation like this is not how you handle a crisis it's that was it was horribly managed um and again that go like i don't know anything about the report i haven't read the report but the people who read it gave a two game or a two week unpaid suspension and then the next day they fire their coach all right that's dumb and my other question is Why does no one ever listen to the players? You know, I, whenever a team comes together and I, I don't know, I guess it's just weird. There's the, there's just this massive mob that is so quick to jump all over everyone. And I see all like the, the national media guys. It's like, here's who should be the next coach. And here's, a guy that I think could do some good work there. And it's like fired, moved on, like 
I don't know. It's just so weird how, how things get handled and how people, how people react. I, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I don't know enough about it to have, have uh, an idea of what should be done with Pat Fitzgerald. I don't know. There's players that are saying that all of these stories are massively embellished that didn't go on. There's people saying that the guy that made the uh, accusations was telling people beforehand that he's just doing it to try and get Fitzgerald fired. I mean, so there's a lot of stuff like going on. I don't know what's right, but it's just, it's, it's weird how you have an independent investigation and you give a two week suspension. And then the very next day you fire your coach. I just, I can't understand that. It's the power of public opinion, man. Yeah, that's true. Cave into the pressure. That's what it is. And public opinion, when you are, when you're an institution like Northwestern, I, I, I think that that is like, we saw, and the Bob Huggins thing continues to get more and more interesting, right? <laughs> He's put out another letter, but when he said what he said on that radio show, right? We saw West Virginia back him. Like that community, that fan base, back him. And, you know, players, like all those things. But West Virginia and Northwestern are very different institutions. And their fan bases look very different, right? I mean, when you when you think about when you think about all of that. So I, I, I think that the school, the reputation of Northwestern, like all of that, I think it's a big factor. Like, oh, we can't, we can't handle this embarrassment. And we talked about it on the last episode. It's, it's hard enough to recruit there. This was going to make it, if they were going to keep him and this was going to hang over that program, this is going to make it really, really different, difficult to get players to go play there. And just really difficult, but it still yeah, it, is. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think, I don't think anything changes there. They're going to blow it up, man. They're going to absolutely blow it up. Right. They just named the defensive coordinator. That's been there for a few months. Right. As the guy that's in charge of, of running the program there, they are going to absolutely clean house. And I think, I think the president, the athletic director, eventually I think they're all gone, right? Because the board of trustees there at Northwestern, I got to imagine, I don't know who's on that board. I got to imagine it's a lot of influential and successful people that are so pissed off about how this entire thing has been handled, right? It's, and yeah, horrible. Like legally, see? they the way they fired him legally was dumb. They didn't. Like the players found out that he was fired on social media, like, and then they had like a Zoom call. Like, the whole thing is just—it's absurd how it was handled. Can you imagine being one of the players that was in on these these stupid little things that they were doing, and you're sitting there and like your coach is now fired because of it? Like, that's got to be an awful feeling awful feeling i i still think about the fact that you know i was i was part of an offensive line that and they can call it whatever they want but that got james Patton fired and it, it it ate at me man like what could i have done better as a player as a leader like to where that guy didn't have to pick up and move his entire family like it ate at me I mean, you think about the legacy, all the guys that have played for Fitzgerald, and if you were one of the guys that was doing this bullshit, I, that has to be – I mean, his legacy is tarnished forever because of this stuff. Forever. The, no one will ever think of Pat Fitz, Fitzgerald the same. Ever. Because of what these guys were doing. And who knows what Fitzgerald knew and how much influence he had on what was going on. I, I don't know. And I'm not sure we'll ever know. But these guys, they, they have to feel awful because their actions, and I once again, I don't know what Fitzgerald knew, 
but their actions ruined the reputation. I, I think it ruined one of the best reputations I can recall for a college football coach. He, I, I had never heard one bad thing about Pat Fitzgerald. Not one. I still really haven't. Yeah. Because I haven't heard, I've heard people, I've heard the suggestion that he must have known. The, but... the president who put out the thing and said, hey, this was my decision alone, right, to fire him. The, the, the statement that he put out, it said that I think it was like 11 more student, former student athletes had come and talked about the hazing and, and the issues in the program. But in that statement, he said that they had they hadn't discovered anything that led them believe to believe that Pat Fitzgerald knew about it. Yeah. From did any this of was those a six month investigation ever go to to Pat Fitzgerald or anyone previously and say something? Like I, I'm not suggesting that coaches have no clue what happens in the locker room. But a lot of times they don't know until someone tells them. Right. Like they're not in there. The coaches typically are not in the locker room. The only time a coach may come through the locker room that I've seen is like directly after practice, having a conversation about something that happened in practice, not necessarily bad or good or whatever. Like a, Hey, I was thinking about this. Like there's just kind of like a walk as everyone walks into the locker room after a practice to me and a game day. Other than that, you may never see a coach in there. So it has to be like, and they, they obviously learn things, but I just, I can't wrap my head around how a coach would know about some of these things. This ain't the nineties. Like when Pat Fitzgerald played, which were there probably a bunch of hazing things everywhere. It's like one of the things that people did. You hear the stories about it, but I can't imagine this day and age that as a coach or a staff, like if you hear about that, that there's not someone that says, listen, maybe all this is harmless, but all it takes is one guy to say that, he's upset about it and this is an absolute you know what storm that can get all of us fired i just don't know how someone doesn't raise their hand and say that if they if they knew it was going on but you know those things do happen so maybe they knew and maybe they thought it was nothing somehow i i want it i want to see the report we will and i do want to say the one i was listening to the cover three, they had a little emergency pod about Fitzgerald getting fired. And Cannell said that he's like, oh yeah, naked bear crawling. It That happens in a lot of locker rooms. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I, you and I, we, we were at Oklahoma, right? One of the biggest programs, nothing like that ever happened when I was at OU. You've never told me anything like that happened when you were at OU. And then, you and I played in a lot of different NFL locker rooms. I never heard one guy talk about having to naked bear crawl in college or in the pros. Like it, to say that happens in a lot of locker rooms, that's just not true. There, that's just I couldn't believe he said that. <laughs> I was just like, wait, what? That doesn't happen in a lot of locker rooms. I I heard stories of things that happened previously, but I never witnessed anything. I heard stories, but I never witnessed anything. And I can't remember for sure, but I feel like Coach Stoops made it a point. I can't remember what year, but he said, no hazing. I think. Um, I know for a fact that whenever I went to the NFL, my rookie year is the greatest thing ever because I was like in the NFL, you hear all kinds of crazy stories. And 
Mariucci first day said there's no hazing in here of any kind. We're doing there's nothing. There's no shaving heads. There's no rookies singing their fight song. There's nothing of any kind. And I was like, yes. So like a coach, I feel like it's a coach's responsibility. Like if you do, as soon as you do that, it's almost like if something happens, I could take care of it at a different day. But you guys have been warned, right? We've had the presentation, no hazing, you know? I I got my head shaved into quite a hilarious pattern, honestly. (laughs) And the GM in Tennessee, Rustin Webster, he claimed he said, that the veteran guys weren't supposed to do that. I don't think he ever said that in a meeting. And he find the absolute hell out of the veteran O lineman that shaved our heads. And then I had to get up in front of the entire team and sing. I played, I played a hit, man. John Legend, ordinary people. I knew everyone would know the words to that song. Standing ovation. Ted got w- performed it, got really into it. Like the they could feel the effort now, yep. whether it sounded good, that is, uh, that's to be determined. It didn't sound good, but it the got key, the people going. That's it. The key. It, don't go with your favorite song. No, don't go with the last song you listen to go with something, you know, everybody knows, and you know, that they'll all chime in instantly. That's and it was quick too. They started, everyone in there started singing quick and it was, for example, Taylor Lewan was the first rounder that year. Love that guy. He selected a song uh, called Show Me Your Genitals. <laughs> and everyone was looking at He got booed. I mean, strong to, boo. He, wasn't, he didn't go to Northwestern, did he? He did not. Michigan man. Oh, uh, okay. Michigan man. I see yeah. what you did there. You but, either want, you kind of want to be average. If you're really good, everyone's going to like, you're going to have to sing for a while by yourself. If you're really bad, everyone's going to like, let's watch this disaster unfold. If you're just kind of like, okay, in the middle, you're going to get some people chiming in quickly. I, I think I was perfectly average, and the older guys appreciated the effort. Nice. That's where, you know, that's why I was like, you know what? I'm just, I'm going for it, man. Just go for it. Yeah, there you go. I like but it. That, that, was, that was my, uh, that and I had to get Andy Levitri and Michael Roos coffee all the time and <laughs> that's why i started drinking coffee there you go true story got them to blame all right let's get to my winner and loser but first john vance auto group has been serving oklahomans for 40 years family owned and operated they've got nine full service dealerships in woodward miami and guthrie no matter what your vehicle needs are john vance auto group has you covered they carry domestic brands such as ford lincoln chevy buick gmc chrysler dodge ram jeep and wagoneer John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way, which is why they have their lifetime loyalty program. Here's how it works. You buy a new or used car from them. All you have to do is get all of the manufacturer-recommended maintenance done at the Vance dealership, and if something goes wrong with the components of your engine, transmission, drive, axle, or transfer unit, they will cover the repair cost. It's a great deal. You can browse their entire inventory or find the John Vance dealership near you at Vance Auto Group. Dot com. And First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs. Checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. Come on, people. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit FFB.com for more information. All right, for my winner of the week, thought about going with the Portland Trail Blazers general manager, Joe Cronin. I just love what he had to say. Got asked about the Damian Lillard situation. Said they're going to be patient when it comes to trading him, right? Lillard has made a trade request. But I loved what he said. Said, hey, we we appreciate everything Damian Lillard's done, but and, and we want the rest, uh, we care about what the rest of his career looks like, but got to do what's best for the Portland Trailblazers. And if it takes months to trade him, then it takes months. I, 
I just loved hearing common sense come out of his mouth. It's like, yeah, we appreciate him. But man, my job is to not do what's best for Damian Lillard. It's to do what is best for this organization. I don't know. It was just, it was nice and refreshing to hear some common sense from a leader in sports. You know, I liked it. It, it was refreshing. Yeah. It, the GM in the NBA is weird because you really get backed into a corner on a lot of these contracts and not, not really saying that Damian Lillard, this doesn't necessarily represent him, but like a lot of times you you have to sign these guys to massive contracts that you know that it's not going to work, right? <laughs> you know, they're not going to be that type of player, but you're kind of put in a position where you, you it's can't the lose rate. the asset. That's it. For nothing. You know, it's, it's tough, man. So not an easy spot, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the way you handle it. Yeah. And yeah. by the way, I think Portland's going to be just fine with Scoot Henderson. He, he didn't play a ton. He got what he hurt his shoulder in that summer league game. I'm sure he's fine, but that is an explosive dude. Mm -hmm. I, I think the shooting will come. That is one explosive dude, but my winner of the week, Christopher Eubanks. Yeah, we're talking tennis. Ted, a little Wimbledon. First of all, guy's an American. He's the only American left in, in, in the men's bracket. Stud. Played tennis at Georgia Tech and just knocked off Tsitsipas. And if anyone watches, what is it, Breakpoint on Netflix, not, not the biggest fan of Tsitsipas. Guy's kind really? of a douche. Okay. Yeah. He just, I don't know. The way that he handled the matchup with Kyrgios last year at Wimbledon and all the things he said, I don't know. He just, I, I don't particularly like the guy, even though very handsome, incredibly talented tennis player. But back to you, Banks. Just an awesome story, man. Right? It, it seems like everything's just coming together for this guy at the right time. Like the lead up to this, he's just, he's been on a roll and this was his first top 10 win in his career because Sitsipas is, I think the, he's the five seed and I think he's the number five player in the world. Wow. So I guess it's also his first top five win then, but just a really, really cool story. And man, it is our patriotic duty to root for the American that's left in Wimbledon. I mean, come on, Ted, let's go. Who's the last American to win Wimbledon men's? I have no idea. My guess is Arthur Ashe. I have no idea. It, no. It, I'm just kidding. Pete Sampras? Well, Sampras definitely. Agus, is Agassi's not American, is he? Yeah. I'm just kidding. I, I don't know. I don't think Roddick ever won it. No, he didn't win it. Last American to win Wimbledon. Oh, Andy Roddick. Oh, he wait. Did win it. No, he, he made the final in 09. Okay. Pete Sampras in 2000. Woo. That's, a, that's called a drought. Guys. Arthur Ashe was on top of mine because I, I saw a stat that Eubanks is the third black American to play in a Wimbledon quarterfinal which is, I mean, pretty, uh, clearly very significant. Guy grew up playing tennis in Atlanta. It's just, it, it's a it's a really interesting story. And yeah, 2000. We're talking an OU football natty drought for Americans at Wimbledon. No doubt. Woo. That's a long time. Ooh, that is, is that a good sign? We need this kid to go win it. That'd be a good sign for us. Yeah, he's got Medvedev in the quarters. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I, I'll say this about you, Banks. I saw him doing some studio stuff on ESPN. That dude is phenomenal on camera. He was breaking down. I'll send it to you. He's breaking down all the things he was thinking, like his strategy during the match uh, with Sitsipas and. It was just really cool as as someone that doesn't know anything about tennis strategy. Like my tennis knowledge is I know the rules. That's it. 
Like that, that's my tennis knowledge. I don't know anything about strategy or what these players are thinking or how, how you even prepare for a match. Like I know none of that. And to hear him talk through that stuff, it was really, really cool for me to hear it. And it was just, you could tell he could almost, he was seeing what he was talking about in his head as he was talking about it. It was really cool. It's cool. It's cool. Hopefully he keeps it going. I like and, that. And he, he said something that really caught my attention. He said in the fourth set, he started seeing the ball big. And then he said early in the fifth, he started seeing the ball huge. And once again, no tennis knowledge, but when I heard him say that, I was like, Ooh, that's good. Like, that's cool. Like, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what it means, but I know, Hey, if you're seeing the ball big, good thing, good thing for a tennis player. Yeah. Well, I know that if I was standing there and someone hit 135 mile an hour serve at me, I wouldn't see the ball at all. <laughs> so if he's seeing it big, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I can imagine when you start to get confident, you, whatever you get a feel for what your, your opponent's doing. And, and yeah, that's, that's confidence, man. How about this? Zone. Andre Agassi born in Vegas. I had no idea. Rebel. No idea. Remember the hair. Oh, that was those, those, those were the glory days of American tennis when Agassi had the hair and the earring the hair, hair, earring, headband, uh, pre-match meth and the rebel camera. Yeah. That's it. There you go. I, I'll say this for you banks. Hope the guy wins. I think he, I think that that match is Wednesday. I, if he can make a run here and let's, let's say he wins it. I'm just telling you, man. And once again, I know nothing about listening to people talk tennis. I'll just tell you right now, that dude had me captivated by the way that he was talking. If he can win some tournaments, right? Maybe if he wins Wimbledon, I don't think there's anything stopping him from being a, you know, like an Orlovsky. Yeah. But for tennis, but like, I, I, I thought he was that good. Now I don't hear a lot of people breaking down tennis all the time. So maybe I'm overreacting, but dude, I'm just telling you, I was, I was blown away by his presence and the way that he was breaking stuff down. It was, it was fascinating. I need to hear that because I'll send it to you. That, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone do that with tennis. Yeah. No, it was, it was cool. All right. But my loser of the week, we were both watching man home run derby. And I'm not saying what those guys were doing. Wasn't really, really impressive. It absolutely was. They were basically doing three straight minutes of cardio. And yeah. then they had their bonus time. <laughs> like it, it did not look fun at all watching those guys huff and buff it just it just looked it looked really taxing for them but this format just isn't fun to watch it, it now I'll, I'll fully admit maybe it's more fun to watch in person right may, maybe it's electric to watch a guy you know blast 41 home runs like like we saw rodriguez do like that was insane by the way but maybe that's really really fun to watch in person but it was not a good TV product. In fact, I think it was an awful TV product. I, I don't want to watch the home run derby when you got a split screen with the tracer, like it's a PGA tour pro hitting a tee shot, man. I just, that's, that's not what I'm trying to watch when I'm watching the home run derby. I want to see how far these dingers are flying. I want the ball to travel. I want the camera to follow it. I want to see the crowd reaction when the people are catching it in the stands I don't need the bonus time. I don't need the cardio workout. I don't need the pitcher to see how many pitches he could throw as fast as he can. Like, I don't want that in my home run derby. It, am I being old or are you on board with me? I am. I'm somewhat on board with you. Now, here's the thing. The old format people hated. Right. It did not go well. That's why they changed it. And when they first changed it, it was awesome. But here's the problem. And this is the, the main problem that you're, you're talking about. And I didn't, I didn't see enough of it last night. As soon as you text me, I flipped it on. Um, they're supposed to wait until the ball lands 
to throw the next pitch. That's how, when they first changed this format, that's how it was. They've totally gotten away from that. And the reason they, they originally did that is because you got a hundred kids out there running around and you don't want a kid trying to catch a fly ball, get drilled with a line drive. Right. So it was a safety thing. And the guys at the plate kept like complaining, I'm running out of time, throw it. And the ump was back there staying with his hand up. So the, their pitchers like, what do I do? So they just started not listening to the ump and throwing it. And then that's where you, you came into this deal where it's just like, quack, quack, quack. It was crazy. <laughs> right. So you like don't these... get in, in the old, like in previously in this new format, you had a chance to watch all the, see how far the ball went and then they'd cut right back and then it'd be the next pitch. But now that they've, they stopped holding them until the ball hit it, that they just rapid fire. You never get to see anything. I, I just want these guys to hit bombs and like watch them. That was the thing. Like these guys weren't even enjoying their work during yeah. the home run derby. They're like, Hey, hit it. Eyes back to the pitcher. Hit it. Like, I want to see the guy's reaction, his smile with how like an, Ooh, like when it goes really, really far. That's what I want to see. But the old format, it there were it, it took too long, right? There yeah. are too many lulls. So here's my suggestion. I want to get your thoughts on it. Go back to the ten outs format. I feel like I feel like it was more dr- dramatic. I feel like it made it, it built tension better. Like oh, he's got to hit four home runs. He's down to two outs. Like that. That was I, I liked that portion of it, but I think you have to you have to implement some type of rule when it comes to taking pitches. You can't take back to back pitches. You got to swing the bat, right? You can't sit there and like ah, uh, and that puts a lot of pressure on the pitcher. I realize that, but hey, it is what it is. I I don't think what we just got works. Right, because and I know there are a lot of people there in person, but it is a television product, and that was a bad television product. So go back to the ten out format and limit the number of pick pitches the guys can take. Or tell them they can't take two pitches in a row. It, it it shouldn't be that hard, but it, I think that would be better than what we just watched. Here's why it is hard. Because essentially what you've got is it's the three-point contest. Who can hit the most home runs in a given amount of time? It's, it's, it's more similar to the three-point contest than it is anything. But a home run is a slam dunk, right? So how do you combine combine a slam dunk contest where there's like you need some style points. You want to see bombs. You want to see how far guys can hit it with like like you've got to com- somehow combine combine volume and like distance. So I like the 10 out rule. Distance tiebreaker. I would say like if you hit it like whatever the number is like what was the number for the I think it was 440 uh, for the bonus time. I would like, I would make that if you're going to do the 10 out format, I would make it further and say that if you hit it past that line, you eliminate a uh, out. You get to keep going. Yeah. Cause uh, you want to, you want to maximize guys trying to hit it as far as they can. Like that is like when you come away from the home run derby, Volume is always going to be something that's impressive, but the guy that hits it the furthest really wins the home run derby. You know, it's like you hit a 500 foot monster. That's what everyone's going to walk away talking about. Yeah. I'm complaining a lot, but congrats, congrats to Vlad Guerrero jr. That's pretty cool. What's first time father, son, huh? Yeah. I think the graphic said he was Cuban, which not correct. Hmm. Not correct. That I, I'm interested. I want to know who typed that graphic up. 
and the type of day they're having today as they get just roasted across social media. Just, I thought, uh, what? Well, well, someone had said. Yeah, I I thought, what? wait, what do you mean? Uh, he was actually born in Canada, dude. Yeah. yeah, his dad was playing baseball. You ever heard of him? Vlad Guerrero. But congrats uh, but... to him on the win. And I thought the coolest thing of the night was Rushman switch hitting. That was that was a strong flex. And I I don't even know. Like it what wasn't that his dad serving him up the meatballs too? Was it his dad so. pitching to him? Yeah. The, that was pretty a lot, sweet. A lot of pressure to put on Pops to go in there, but uh, if, if you're not necessarily uh as worried as like like if you know you're not gonna win it, go have fun with it. You know, one of those things, I don't know, but that's a lot like the pressure is more, it's a weird dynamic that the guy that's under the most amount of pressure is the, the guy serving up the balls instead of the hitter. That's what I'm saying. It shouldn't be that way. Now it, there's always going to be pressure on the pitcher, no matter what format you go with, but I bet there's some pitchers today (laughs) that threw that, that are icing their arms, man. (laughs) That was a lot of throwing. Well, that's, when I watch the home run derby, all I think about is blisters with how hard they're swinging just Oof. over and over and over. It's like, and I know they've got their hands built up for that, but that's, that's all I can think about when I'm seeing those guys grip that bat and just I 110% effort. I know this. I don't want when the guys are done swinging, I don't want it to look like they just went on a Peloton, right? Like, and they can barely breathe. I felt so bad for those dudes. Like, I don't care to hear them talk either, especially whenever they're that out of breath. Just, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, this is not know, that. He oh, threw it up there and then I hit it. You know? Yeah. This, all, this home run derby is like the hardest cardio workout these baseball guys have had in a while. Crazy. Yeah. It's impressive, also, though, man. Impressive. Yeah, saw a, a Rushman clip of him. He was a kicker at Oregon State. I didn't know that. He tackled Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. Huh. Multi-sport athlete, baseball player, and kicker. That's, That's fascinating. fascinating. Wow. Okay. Yeah, go check it out. Saw fascinating. the clip going around on Twitter. It's like, oh. Hmm. And on that note, episode 335 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that will drop Sunday. Should have a lot of good stuff. You know, to recap from Big 12 Media Day, just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me on SiriusXM Big 12 Radio Channel 375. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend when it rolls around. And until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.